has some uh, genealogy, a little bit of a little bit of paper money history or coin history here. Uh, the story begins in 1804. Uh, businessmen in this area have just completed building the Merchant's Road from Canandaigua to Charlotte. Uh, we still have part of that Merchant's Road. The Merchant's Road was built uh, to facilitate delivery of mail and to facilitate uh, commerce between Canandaigua, which was the big city, and uh, Rochester, or Rochesterville, which was the small city. It wasn't Rochesterville yet. Canal, or Castletown was established in 1804 by Colonel Isaac Castle on the Genesee River near Brooks Avenue. Uh, Oliver Culver, Culver was purchasing goods at Tryon near Rondecoit Bay and shipping them to Cleveland and making a killing. Uh, we see all these names or we hear all these names in local history around here when you're driving down 590, the expressway, you see Tryon or Tryon Park. Uh, in New England, in 1804, just outside of Boston, um, Darius Perrin was born. And that's who we're going to focus in on. Hatter, hangman, postmaster, and banker. His parents would soon move to what became Rochester. He was a distant cousin of the founder of Perrinton. So you probably have heard that name, Perrinton. I went to the Perrinton Historical Society and they said, we don't know anything about this guy. Uh, we don't even have a photo of him or a picture of him. Well, anyway, at age 16, Darius was apprenticed to Arthur J. Colvin. Colvin was Rochester's first hatter. Um, the town in 1820 was only three years old, but it had nearly 2,000 people. Uh, all men wore hats, some of them made from bur beaver fur felt. That's hard to say, beaver fur felt. Um, but he was a hatter and everybody wore a hat. Now, by 1825, Perrin learned his trade well enough that as a 21-year-old man, he went into the hat business with John Hayes. Uh, this was the same year the Erie Canal opened in Rochesterville, and the population jumped to 5,273. Uh, Rochester was a real boom town, and some people say it was the first boom town in America. Five years later, in 1830, Perrin became Monroe County's under sheriff. Uh, in 1838, one of his duties was that of hangman. Uh, if you go to Lyons and see the uh, jail in Lyons, the old historic jail in Lyons, you'll see uh, where they hanged people, and it's still there, the gallows. It's long gone in Rochester. Well, anyway, his job was the hanging sheriff, under sheriff. Uh, he participated in the county's last hanging, that of Octavius Barron, who was convicted of murder. Perrin refused his fee. By 1839, he was elected county sheriff on the Whig party ticket. The following year, 1840, saw a completion of the Rochester and Auburn Railroad. So you could now take the train to Auburn, and pretty soon you could take the train to Buffalo. Uh, this began the end of the canal era, although the uh, New York State Legislature protected the canal. Uh, railroads weren't supposed to run their trains at the same time the canal was running, or near where the canal was, where, where the canal was running. Uh, the Western New York State Agricultural Society was founded in 1840. The first plate glass windows were introduced by Abelard Reynolds in his downtown arcade, the Reynolds Arcade. The first Jewish religious service was held in Rochester in 1840. And Darius Parent was named postmaster for Brighton. Now, jumping to 1848, it was a wonderful time in politics. People forget. You know, now they say, isn't this the, just the most crude uh, <laughs> election that you could ever imagine? They forget. You know, if, if we went back and even looked at Andrew Jackson, I mean, at that time, uh, what we see now with Trump and the, boy, and the boys is, is calm compared to what was going on. But anyway, 1848, a wonderful time in politics. <laughs> Rochester's first women's rights convention was held. Brawls broke out on the street over the choice of political candidates. Returning from a political rally, Perrin was saved from physical harm by being pulled into a doorway. His companion, Frederick Whittlesey, was not so lucky and suffered a broken nose. Uh, people expressed their political opinions with their fists. Uh, they had been campaigning for Zachary Taylor for president, old rough and ready. Well, old rough and ready 
was elected, and Perrin was named postmaster for all of Rochester, part of patronage here. Uh, he held this post through 1853, when the next president, Millard Fillmore, left office. Uh, I guess Darius Perrin was expected to, to leave office, too. Postmaster, by the way, was the highest paying federal job in the county at that time. Upon leaving federal office, Perrin partnered with banker, private banker, William Breck. He also was involved with his younger brother, Horace Perrin, in a milling business and land speculation in Marshall County, Michigan. Darius supplied the money, raised here in Rochester, sent it out to Michigan, much of which, again, was raised here in Rochester. Darius Perrin must have been successful for in 1853, he purchased a mansion at 137 State Street for $32,700. Wow. This was at a time when a, a teacher, an experienced teacher, might possibly make $350 a year. And here we have Darius buying a $37,000 house, reported to be the most expensive house in Rochester. Toward the end of 1853, Cholera swept the city. Over 700 cases were reported with over 400 deaths. But things began to return to normal by mid-1854. Perrin and his silent partner, Joseph Sibley, not, not of, this is the Sibleys of Western Union, not the Sibleys of the store, uh, while he and his silent partner opened a bank at 58 State Street. The bank was capitalized at $200,000 quite a hefty sum at that time, with some of the funding coming from Perrin and his partners, and apparently from uh, the Erie Canal money deposited uh, in that bank, so that we had, uh, we had a waylock here in Rochester. People coming down the canal had to pay toll, and where did the toll money go? Well, it went into local banks, which was kind of an interesting idea. Uh, as with most banks at the time, the Perrin Bank issued its own paper currency, and I'll show you some in a minute if you haven't seen it up on, up on the table here. Notes were printed in New York City by the American Banknote Company in denominations of one, two, and five dollars. Again, five dollars was perhaps at this time an average weekly salary. Many of the banknotes were shipped to Michigan where Perrin's brother, Horace, used them in business transactions. Horace had his brother's power of attorney at that time, and he spent bank funds very, very <coughs> liberally. Um, each year after 1855, the bank reported fewer <coughs> funds in its resources. Uh, in 1855, the local newspaper printed uh, a notice of a $500 reward uh, for the return of $1,600 stolen from the bank, a large sum of money at that time. Mysteriously, and it didn't explain how in the newspaper, uh, all but $203 was recovered in a short time. Perhaps it was an inside job. We don't know. <laughs> By 1863, with bank funds down to $14,000, uh, Perrin sold his home and moved to a more modest quarter at 31 North St. Paul Street with his office at 2 Market Street down along the river. The bank closed in 1864, but Perrin retained a, a stock brokerage, a currency exchange, and an insurance office. So he wasn't hurt. He was doing all right. Printing plates for parents' banknotes, which was typical for this time. The printing plates for the banknotes were destroyed in 1864 under state supervision, and a sinking fund was set up in Albany, whereby holders of such notes could redeem them until May 6, 1876. So if you had the notes, you could ship them to Albany, and you would get your money back. Uh, many states, like Michigan or Indiana or other places, uh, if the bank went out of business and you had money still in your hands, too bad. You know, those were broken banks. This wasn't a broken bank. It's likely that all the notes were redeemed or destroyed as no genuine notes are known to exist. Everyone was, or they're gone. Um, what does exist are some poorly made counterfeits created from printing plates of the Clinton Bank of Westport, Maryland. On these 1860 notes, the Clinton Bank's name was replaced by the Perrin name. The seal was changed, as was the city in which they were issued. Darius and his brother's name appear on the counterfeits. No one was arrested for making bogus money, but who knows where it was made. And a lot of this money was circulating way out in uh, the Midwest. 
you know, and people were willing to accept notes from Rochester because Rochester had a good reputation. The story, by the way, doesn't end here. Um, all the money Horace was borrowing, his brother Horace, uh, from Perrin, seems to finally have resulted in a windfall for Darius. His brother Horace died in 1879 in Marshall, Michigan, near Battle Creek. In his will, he left Darius over $100,000 uh, and an annual annuity for the rest of his life. Each, he and each of his family got $800 a year um, and as part of this annuity. Darius' family members also received the annuity. Um, Horace's estate eventually was settled for $800,000. So they did, they did pretty well, and that money went to Darius. Um, Darius lived on in retirement until his death in 1894. He was 90 years old at the time. He had a pretty full life. Let me show you what his, his notes look like. First of all, and you can see this one. In 1894, when Darius died, just before he died, he must have had his picture taken, and, and it was done as an engraving here. First Rochester Sheriff, 1837, banker, postmaster, but there he is. Now, the bills, here in my hand, I made them a little bit larger so we can see them. On this side it says, the parent bank, and below the parent bank, it says, Rochester. But you look at the Rochester and you look at the Perrin Bank and it's done with kind of a shaky hand and it's kind of blurred. It just doesn't look right. Um, over here, they changed the seal to something that's kind of illegible. And I don't know who this person is. He shows up on a lot of early money. And we have Horace and Darius signing it. We see the Auburn Railroad going through here and we see a tunnel with the railroad going through it. Now this is, this is the Darius Perrin Bank note counterfeit. Uh, and this is the Clinton Bank of Westport, Maryland. Hmm. Looks very similar. Uh, now apparently when this bank went out of business they did not destroy their printing plates. And somebody got a hold of the printing plates down at the American Banknote Company and, and got rid of the Clinton Bank in Westport, uh, Maryland and a few other things and then just added the Darius Bank on here, which wasn't, which wasn't uncommon. You'll see a lot of the vignettes used more than once on these early notes. And with that, we uh, say goodbye. And when you drive through Perrin, think of his cousin. <laughs> okay.